Good afternoon. The Committee of Education today's date is Tuesday, February 16th, 2 o'clock p.m. In, p.m. It's conference room 309. We have about nine bills on the agenda today. Yeah, first we will have Vice Chair Capella with housekeeping. In order to allow for as many people to testify as possible, there will be a two minute time limit per testifier. Please keep yourselves muted and your videos off while waiting to testify and after your testimony is complete. The Zoom chat function will allow you to chat with the technical staff only. So please use the chat only for technical issues. If you are disconnected unexpectedly, you may attempt to rejoin the meeting. If disconnected while presenting testimony, you may be allowed to continue if time permits. Please note that the house is not responsible for any bad internet connections on the testifier's end. In the event of a catastrophic network failure, it may be necessary to reschedule the hearing or schedule a meeting for decision making. In that case, an appropriate notice will be posted. Please refrain from any profanity or uncivil behavior. Such behavior may be grounds for removal from the hearing without the ability to rejoin. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. First up, we have HB 533, Special Purpose Revenue Bonds and Late Jordan Academy, INC. We have testimony from HSTA in opposition. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Woodson, members of the committee. Uh, HSTA opposes HB 533. HSTA believes that public money should be used, public money should not be used for private institutions. The Hawaii Department of Education does already does not have enough funding to maintain its current facilities. Uh, the Jacob study that was commissioned by the DOE put the number for basic repair and maintenance at $7 billion. And when all priorities are taken into effect, that would be $11 billion. In 2019, the DOE requested $783 million of CIP projects, and the legislature was only able to afford about $281 million. Over the next two years, we're seeing a decrease even to that of $150 million per year. As part of uh, HSTA's testimony, we try to include many pictures of our current status of school facilities. Unfortunately, there were so many, the 20 megabyte uh, restriction took place. So we were only able to include two, but to give a sampling. So we would ask uh, the members of the committee to oppose HB 533. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That's all I have on my testifiers list. Is there anyone else wishing to provide testimony on HB 533? We also have testimony from Director Harai, Budget and Finance, providing comments. Uh, members, any questions? Seeing none, moving on to HB 1078, Hawaii School for the Deaf and Blind Charter School Conversion. First up, we have is the Department of Education providing comments. Oh, hi, good afternoon, Chair Woodson and Vice Chair Capella. I'm Heidi Armstrong from the Department of Education speaking on behalf of um, Superintendent Christina Kishimoto. And the department understands the intent of House Bill 1708 and has offered its concerns in the written testimony. I would like to highlight that the Hawaii School for the Deaf and Blind is a statewide placement option for any student whose IEP team has determined that an American Sign Language immersion environment is needed in order to receive educational benefit. And if this school were to convert to charter status, the option would be no longer available to all students and another school offering these services would need to be created. Thank you. Thank you, we received your testimony. Next, we have testimony from Aloha State Association of the Deaf providing testimony in support. Is the State Association of the Deaf here? Okay, we will move on for now. Uh, we also have individual testimony from Deborah Jackson. Jackson, providing testimony and support. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, my name. My name is. Oops. Can you see me? We, we can hear you. Okay. We can see you on and off, but we <laughs> okay. My name is Deborah Jackson, and I am a de I'm a deaf advocate as well as a person with a disability myself. I'm hard of hearing. That's why I'm wearing a headset and a microphone so that I can hear you clearly. 
And it's, I know you have my testimony in front of you. I do support this bill. And I'd like to point out some very, um, a very important part of my testimony is that anytime you do planning with a group of people, especially people with disabilities, it's important to include them from the beginning. And I think the purpose of this bill, when we introduced it last year, was we wanted to get something established so that um, people who are deaf could have a board set up with the school. And there wasn't a way to do that with a public school. So we we looked at the option of possibly a charter school being an alternative. And so I wanted to mention that because we've been working on this bill for several years now. And I think it's important because just working for working with deaf people and educating deaf people is not just about um, someone teaching someone who can't hear and signing. Because basically, if the deaf person does not have deaf parents, they don't have a language, not unless their parents have tried to sign. Because if you think about it, when you're very young, we learn language by, um, you know, we learn language by hearing people, by interacting with our environment, and putting children into a school without using people who are deaf educators, people who are skilled in signing, it's very difficult to teach deaf people. So, and also included in the category is not only deaf people, but, <laughs> but students who are also deaf and blind, both, because I have several friends that are deaf and blind, as well as I know there are several students who... Um, who are also deaf and blind. So we need to consider what types of communication skills and what type of education they need. So I would urge you to look at this bill. I, under, I heard Department of Education's comments, and I still think it's very important to deaf people and deaf blind people and educators of people who are deaf and blind to have some say in the planning process and something to do so that they're also vested in the program. Thank you very much for letting me testify. Thank you for your oral testimony. I see Omaha State Association of the Deaf is present. Go ahead. Mr. Chevy. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. We greatly appreciate it. And sign language, unfortunately, I, I don't know sign language. We did have a member on the committee actually that did fluently uh, understand sign language. But thank you for your testimony, your very important testimony. That's all I have on my testifiers list. We also have testimony from Maui Deaf Friends in support. We have testimony from HGEA in opposition. And we have testimony from about half a dozen individuals all in support. Is there anyone else here wishing to provide testimony on this measure? Seeing none, members, are there any questions? Any questions on HB 1078? 
Seeing none, moving on. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, HB 443, Department of Education and Cost Analysis with regards to locally grown food for student meals. First up, we have the Food and Funeral Initiative providing testimony and support. Good afternoon, Chair Woods. Chair Woodson, Michael Munikata here on behalf of the Ulupono Initiative. We stand on our testimony in support of this measure. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Next, we have Hawaii Farm Bureau providing testimony and support. Good afternoon, Chair Woodson, Vice Chair Capello, members of the committee. Brian Miyamoto here on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. Hawaii Farm Bureau will stand on its written testimony in support. Thank you so much for being here. Next, we have Local Food Coalition providing testimony and support. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Garibaldi on behalf of the Local Food Coalition. Uh, we stand on our written testimony uh, in strong support. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. We also have testimony from Hawaii Department of Agriculture providing comments, Land Use Research Foundation in support, Hawaii Primary Care Association providing testimony in support, Food Policy Internship providing testimony in support, MEES, providing testimony and support. We have Hawaii Farm to School Hawaii, providing testimony and support. Testimony from Hawaii Alliance of Progressive Action in support, Hawaii Cameraman Council in support. And we have testimony from about uh, a dozen plus individuals all in support. Is there anyone else here looking to provide testimony? Uh, members, are there any questions? Hey, thank you all for being here. Moving on to HB 702, HD 1, establishing farm to school procurement rules with regards to geographic preference. First up, we have this is the Department of Education, ASNACA, providing testimony and support. ASNACA, we, uh, you're, you're muted. Got it. Okay. Hello. Uh, Chair Woodson, thank you very much for your time and the committee's time. We stand on, on our testimony and uh, appreciate uh, the efforts to vitalize, revitalize our, our farm and school uh, programs. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for being here. Next, we have Ulupono Initiative providing testimony and support. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. Michael Munikata with Ulupono Initiative, standing on our testimony in strong support. Thank you. Much for being here. Next, we have Hawaii Farm Bureau providing testimony in support. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee, Brian Miyamoto, here on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. Uh, we support this measure. Uh, we believe that this proposed geographic preference will provide flexibility that's going to increase the purchasing from, as many of us said, our, our biggest restaurant in the state, uh, the DOE. And it's going to really help our farmers and ranchers. Um, and we really need to make sure that we do offer the flexibility. Uh, our state is made up mostly of small farmers and it's extremely hard for any one farmer uh, to provide the necessary products for the entire DOE. So thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for being here. We know the author did a lot of work on this proposal. Uh, next we have Hawaii Food Industry Association providing testimony and support. Okay, we have Local Food Coalition providing testimony support. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. John Garibaldi on behalf of the uh, Local Food Coalition. Uh, we stand in on our written testimony in strong support. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We also have testimony from State Procurement Office providing testimony and support supporting the amendments. We have Hawaii Department of Agriculture providing comments. We have Land Use Research Foundation. Providing testimony and support. We also have Blue Zones Project providing testimony and support. Hawaii Primary Care Association testimony and support. EEES providing testimony and support. Food Policy Internship in support. Democratic Party of Hawaii Environmental Caucus in support. Hawaii Farm to School Hawaii in support. Bono Hawaii Initiative providing testimony and support. Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action in support. Hawaii Cattle Men's Council in support. We also have 
about three and a half dozen individuals all testifying in support. And I see here, we also have individual testimonies present potentially. Elaine Nani, writing testimony in support. Is Elaine here? Not present. Not present, okay. That's all I have on my list. Is there anyone else wishing to provide testimony on this particular proposal? See none, members, are there any questions? A question. Okay. Majority Leader Bilotti. Uh, for Mr. Tanaka, please. Yes, Rev. Lottie, how can we help you? Thank you. So based on your testimony, while you're saying that it's, this is being supporting the intent, um, one of the obstacles you kind of throw up is the fact that you have to work closely in coordination um, with the Department of Office of Operations and Facilities and Office of Fiscal Services. So my understanding is that Kohala has already successfully done a pilot project that basically shows that proof of concept has already been proven. Is that correct? There are a number of locations. Kauai has a, a successful program. Kohala, yes. Um, it's a matter of scale, uh, how big that operation could be, uh, and the continued expansion of acquiring the, the local product. So it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, there is a number of success stories out there, yes. Okay, because I think if this builds to move forward, I think, you know, putting up any further obstacles to say that, you know, it hasn't been done is, is you know, we should, we should look at what's been done. We should take what Kohala, what Kauai has done. If it means that they have the basis of the rules, it shouldn't take you two years to make rules. I mean, I really think that this is something that could be done on an expedited basis because we have these successful places. Uh, I understand that there would be some unique circumstances around each area, but but really we have the blueprint for this. Would you agree with that? We we have a number of blueprints. I, I agree with that. Um, but you know every location is kind of unique, um, and like I said, it's scale. Uh, but we will yeah. certainly take and learn from what they have done. And we there's a farm to school hui that. We meet uh, twice a month, and we have been in those discussions. Um, the, the barrier to success should not be a time issue. Um, so we're, we're working hard on that. Okay, and I'm sure that all of the stakeholders that are on this are glad to hear you say that you will work with them actively, because I think, again, this is something that they've been kind of cycling in for, yeah. for a couple of years already. So I think there shouldn't be a delay if this bill were to move forward. But thank you, uh, Mr. Tanaka. I know you have a hard job ahead of you, but I just think we have a lot of community people who are interested in this based on the testimony. So the, the degree to which we can use them would be a wonderful um, partnership. Well, absolutely, you, you, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, our intention, although well meant, is, can only be successful if we deliver on those intentions and that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Majority Leader. Members, do we have any questions? Okay. Seeing none, moving on to HB 767 HD1 Farm to School Program. First, we have is uh, Ada Tanaka providing testimony supporting the intent. Hello, Chair Woodson. Uh, once again, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, we stand in, uh, on our testimony uh, and appreciate everyone's efforts towards this. Uh, the goal is the same. and. Uh, we will certainly work hard to get this executed. Thank you for being here, A.S. Tanaka. Next, we have uh, Ulupono Initiative providing testimony and support. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Michael Munikata on behalf of the Ulupono Initiative. We stand on our testimony and support. We do offer one friendly amendment just to um, add some weight behind the goal itself. Um, it's a measurement. Um, it's a it's a quick phrase at the end of the goal that says as measured by the percent of total cost of food. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next we have Hawaii Farm Bureau providing testimony support. Thank you, Chair. The Hawaii Farm Bureau will stand on its written testimony in support. Next we have Local Food Coalition providing testimony in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. John Garibaldi again on behalf of the Local Food Coalition. Uh, we'll stand on our written testimony and support. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next, we have Hawaii Farm School, Hui, providing testimony in support. Aloha Kako, my name is Lydie Bernal, Hawaii Farm to School Hui Coordinator with Hawaii Public Health Institute, also testifying on behalf of the Obesity Prevention Task Force. We support this bill and we also recommend amendments. Um, it's definitely a team effort. So we're proposing that it also stay in Department of Agriculture. A holistic farm to school program in the DOE is absolutely key. So addressing school gardens, agriculture education, and also the school food improvements, right? We're gonna, we're gonna see success when that educational component is integrated. Uh, we also believe it's still the kuleana of Department of Agriculture to address the issues of supply, distribution, and supporting the procurement for all state agencies. So there are other bills at work this session. House Bill 817 is one example, um, asking all state agencies to have a certain amount of local food procured. Uh, we, we advocate that we still need a program and a position in Department of Agriculture as well as the DOE. And we just really wanna express our great appreciation to the legislature and all the partners for your support of Farm to School and Farm to State. Mahalo. Thank you so much for being here. Next we have testimony, individual testimony from Ali Nani, providing testimony in support. Ms. Nani is not present. We also have testimony uh, that is not present from Kona Hawaii Initiative, providing testimony and support, Hawaii Cattlemen's Council in support. And again, we have about three and a half dozen individuals all providing testimony in support. Is there anyone here wishing to provide testimony on this bill? Seeing none, members, any questions? Uh, Representative Tukoy. Thank you, Chair. Randy, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, as of today, how much uh, food do you actually have from local, locally sourced to the schools? So, you know, I took a, a snapshot of one of our largest schools in Honolulu, Mililani High School. And there is a, a program that is part of the USDA and the feds. And I looked at uh, commodities, especially in the, the fruits and vegetables area. So from the period of September to December of 2019, we had uh, purchased about 11,000, 12,000 pounds of, of produce product. Uh, when, when we break it down, 52% came from California, 36% came from Washington, and 12% came from locally grown products. And this is just a small snapshot, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to balance it with other information. Of that, 96% of the local product we bought was papaya. And the... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a cross feed. Okay, we, we can't hear that cross feed on our side. Um, and if you can try to work through it, if not, we also understand. Yeah, let me just, just finish through. The other, the other commodities, these were quite small, green onions, tomatoes, and cucumbers. So that number represents locally bought about 12%, um, which is, is a small amount, but that's, that's the beginning of the data capture that we need to do to a greater extent across the state. And then I'll be, be in better, better position to, to tell you how we're gonna grow this local consumption. The regionalization is a good thing to do because it reduces carbon footprint impact instead of sending stuff all across the state. It supports the local community, the local farmers and build that kind of relationship. So we're working through the mechanics of getting this done at a higher degree. So that's kind of about what the split is right now. So, so Randy, just on the 12%, what does it cost the Department of Education to make that purchase of the oh, locally sourced? I, I did not capture that data uh, rep, um, but we, we are in the process of doing that from a revenue standpoint and percentage of revenue. The, the kind of how we got to this point, I think, is that it's very easy to work with the brokers. 
right? And then if, if we have a farmer short here, they would fill that gap with the other farmers they work with uh, or the other product that they work with. Um, so we have to have to solve that problem. Maybe it's a, a, a group of farmers that we ask to grow cucumbers. So if, we, if one farmer is short, we can fill the gap with the other guys. Um, the other thing we're working on is process, right? Farmers like to farm. They don't like to fill out forms. So we're going to help them fill out those forms so, so they can focus on farming. We've got our deal together and we build recipes, menus against the product. And we got to let them know three months ahead of time, right? Because it's not like they can just pop it out of the, the garden tomorrow. So we're working on that process um, and, and go from there. So, so Randy, of your actual basic five food groups that you folks provide in the lunch meals, what would one lunch meal cost based the on local the, produce and supplies versus imports if we had to do a match? I, from what I understand, our lunch cost is about seven dollars, and our breakfast cost is four dollars. So it's it's fairly small, um, and the nutrition requirements are are governed by our food uh, nutrition branch, the child nutrition branch, and the feds primarily. Um, but that's kind of how it it sits now. Uh, you should know that there's a a broker's cost. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because they provide us a product that is safe and pre-cleared from a food safety standpoint. If I'm pulling stuff from the gardens, I got to make sure that they're, you know, they're they're safe, right? Um, you know, I, lack of a better description, and it's, this is not a good one. Is that if I've got a slug on that lettuce, right? I need to make sure that we're not serving that. Stuff. So we'll, we we work through that. And the, the brokers do a good job for us on that. So Randy, clarification, $7 is um, import sourced or is it a local local um, food source? That comes from the broker. I don't have a segmentation of that yet. Um, so there could be a cost differential. Um, but one of the concerns I have in the longer range is as uh, other markets get strong again, i.e. tourism, I'm gonna end up competing with those guys. So I've got to make sure the product that we serve our children, our students, um, is not a direct competition with that market that's going to return. And a good example is beef. So beef, uh, the stew meat and hamburgers is, is a good product for us, not necessarily for the, the visitor market. So we need to, it's, it's a product of all beef, and we need to help shore up that what, you know, those kind of products that are not selling in, in the, in that market. So we're working towards that. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative. And just a further clarification, it's an op-ed. Is that seven and $4 respectively with or without the USDA um, 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 buyback? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Chair Woodson, I can't hear you. Sure. So your the seven and four dollars that you referenced, does that figure include the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture reimbursement, or is that without the reimbursement? No, that's the gross cost. We get a, a reimbursement from the Fed of about fifty percent. The state subsidizes another twenty five percent, and uh, that's kind of how it it shakes out. One of the areas that we really got hurt from COVID is the the sales that happen in schools for, for uh, students that are not subsidized, that all went away. So our revenue stream dropped by 25%. Uh, so that, that money obviously goes to subsidizing the food program. So we're a little bit challenged in that area. We're working through that. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Representative Zukoi. Um, Randy, uh... Locally sourced versus imports. Where are they on the food safety compliancy? I'm sorry? Locally sourced compared to imports. Where are they on, on food safety compliancy? It, it, it's, uh, it's very good. Um, the, the areas that we are most watchful uh, is food preparation at our kitchens. 
Um, so that, that we have not had a problem as far as I know in terms of the product delivered to us, right? So we stay close on issues, um, for example, meatloaf. If meatloaf is not cooked properly and there's, you know, we just got to make sure that our, our kitchens are, are delivering the product in a safe manner. But we haven't had problems as far as I know of product delivered to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for everything. Any other questions, members? I have a quick question for uh, the Hawaii Farm to School Hui. If they are still here. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, for your testimony, I, I, I didn't recall seeing any other recommendations to, to have the Department of Agriculture spearhead the effort. It seems from the conversations that I've had, and even the conversations here, that AS Tanaka has been a willing partner and is able to, to move progress forward. Uh, what was your recommend, why was your recommendation to keep the spearheading within the Department of Agriculture? Is there something else that you wanna illuminate that we're not aware of? Sure, thank you for asking. And just to clarify, what we're saying is, can we have the program as well as dedicated positions in both departments? Um, our testimony in writing suggests that yes, it be added to Department of Education as written. And the portion where it references, you know, the strike through of the Department of Agriculture's program, can we, instead of striking through the whole statute, change it to farm to state from farm to school and narrow the focus, right? Because it, you know, going into DOE, it makes sense to be holistically including education right, school gardening, as well as school food. Um, but when it comes to Department of Agriculture, we still need their focus on building the supply side, as well as the distribution, for example, working with food hubs and other distributors um, to make that connection to the DOE. When we were working with um, DOE, when they had a farm to school coordinator in place, you know, he would express that DOE has a kuleana in terms of receiving the food and making sure everything is happening with their, within their department, but they can't also take on the whole issue of growing our food systems so that there is that supply that AS Tanaka was also referring to, right? To meet this growing demand. Does that clarify for you? Yes, thank you. It just seems like the department is, is facilitating those types of conversations. And so I just wanna, to make sure I wasn't missing something, but thank you so much for your articulation on your testimony. Uh, members, any other questions? Seeing none, moving on to HP 812, Trauma Informed Education and the Department of Education. First up, we have Yo E providing comments. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify again. I'm Heidi Armstrong, Department of Education, and we respectfully offered comments on HB 812. As described in our testimony, the department is very committed to a trauma-informed education system. In our testimony, we've des described our capacity building initiatives to date to support a trauma-informed educational system, which include our Act 271 efforts, 271 efforts. We also were the recipients of a $5 million um, US Department of Education trauma recovery discover trauma recovery demonstration grant. And within this grant, we do um, have Kailua High School, Waimanalo Middle and in Intermediate School, um, Kau and Pahala School and Na'alehu Elementary School as um, um, participants in this demonstration grant. The department has also put together trauma-informed practice virtual series for any employee we have specific training available for our school-based behavioral health specialist in a nationwide trauma-informed learning community called the National Council, Council for Behavioral Health's 2021 Trauma-Informed Resilience-Oriented Approaches Learning Community. And then upcoming, we are putting together trauma-informed evidence-based practice training with certification opportunities for our school-based behavioral um, staff and um, additional trauma-informed training packages. So the department truly values the purpose of HB 812 and our comments um, basically state that we don't feel additional legislation 
is required at this time to support um, trauma-informed education. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, that's all I have on my testifiers list. That's wishing to testify via Zoom. Is there anyone else here wishing to provide testimony for this proposal? We also have testimony from Hawaii Youth Services Network in support, Hawaii Kids Can in support, Democratic Party Hawaii Education Caucus in support, Hawaii Children's Action Network Speaks in support, Hawaii Primary Care Association in support. And we have testimony from four individuals all in support. Uh, members, any questions? Okay, we're just in the go ahead. Ms. Armstrong. You there? Uh, A.S. Armstrong? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for your testimony and for the information regarding the steps that the DOE is taking to do a continuum of care and services for students. I noticed in your testimony you mentioned trauma informed practices virtual schooling. Please tell the committee um, what some of those strategies are. Um, so we, the testimony mentioned trauma informed care strategies to prepare for the return of school. Um, what, what, what do they consist of? Um, some strategies include the culturally, com culturally competent practices, the student voice, um, student and staff safety. And I'm going to turn it over right now to our expert in this field, Fern Yoshida, who can describe these in great detail. Aloha. My name is Fern Yoshida, and I am the project manager for the Trauma Recovery Grant, along with social emotional learning for the department. Um, some of the other areas that the training focused on is wellness and resiliency strategies, specifically related to distance learning and return to learn practices. We also covered the trauma informed care strategies. Um, and essentials for self-care as well. I, I see that in the testimony, but I was hoping you could explain what those strategies are, what, what kind of things you're telling, um, what, what that you're talking about with students and with um, the teachers. So uh, the training was conducted from a local perspective focusing on areas such as um, relationship building, how you develop a positive culture and interaction with each other, learning a little bit about the ACEs, the adverse childhood information and strategies to support those students. It talked a little bit about the protective factors. So having a adult that the students can go to, having meaningful activities, for example, and um, some of the focus on literacy as well. It talked about vicarious trauma and how adults should be aware of that and strategies to support themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, members, any other questions? Seeing none, moving on to HB 574, HB 1, related to disaster relief funds and the Department of Education. First, we have DOE providing comments. Good afternoon, Chair Woodson, Vice Chair Capella, and committee members. Brian Hallett, DOE CFO, testified on behalf of Superintendent Kishimoto. The department stands on it with its written testimony with comments regarding Section 1 and 2 of this measure. Thank you, and we'll stand by if there are any questions. Thank you. And CFO your, your sound is um, it's a bit varied, it's a bit, a bit variable. So if you can check to see if you can fix that. Oh, we can hear you, but it's not crystal clear. Next, we have uh, Haima providing testimony in opposition. Mr. Myers. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is uh, Luke Myers. I'm the administrator in the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. IEMA stands opposing House Bill 574 as written. Uh, we are available for further discussion as necessary. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. That's all I have on my testifiers list. Is there anyone else to provide testimony on this bill? 
Okay, seeing none, we will move our members. Are there any questions? Seeing none, moving on to HD 613, proposed HD 1. First, we have the Board of Education providing comments. They are not present, pardon me. We have Department of Education providing comments. Good afternoon, Chair Woodson, Vice Chair Capella, and members of the committee. I'm Christina Kishimoto, Superintendent of the Hawaii Department of Education. I have submitted written testimony and offer comments on this measure. The elementary and secondary school emergency relief grant received from the U.S. Department of Education is meant to address the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our public education system. My recommendation to the Board of Education for this, these one-time funds is to provide solutions to address unmet needs for public school resources to address severe learning gaps, provide for health and safety measures related to reopening schools, and offset critical shortfall areas, which goes beyond the staffing component. We agree school leaders, teachers, and staff are an important component to an effective education system and believe these positions need to be secured through permanent positions and permanent funding, not one-time relief funds. When the department released the school's financial plans, everyone saw the devastating impact the budget reductions would have on our schools. We simply do not have enough funds to run a quality public school system, and we have sustained a loss to our base budget this 2020-21 school year. Thank you for this opportunity to provide comments on this bill and welcome the conversation around bringing predictability, reliability, and adequacy of funding for our schools that our students deserve. Mahalo. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Kishimoto, for being here and for your testimony. Next, we have testimony from HSTA, providing testimony and support. Hello, Chair Woodson, members of the committee. HSTA strongly supports HB 613. HB 613 instructs the Department of Education to comply with the provisions of the Federal Education Stabilization Fund, specifically Section 315 and 317. Furthermore, the bill states the DOE must use the CARES Act and CRS CRRS Appropriations Act to offset any budget reductions that have been identified at or proposed by the Department of Education and the governor that would result in the reduction of personnel who are subject to a collective bargaining agreement and who are employed at the school level, including any budget reduction that results in a layoff, furlough, or pay reduction. Currently, nearly 1,000 DOE employees, that includes 700 teachers, are concerned about layoffs for the next school year. Section 315 of the Federal Stimulus Bill says the following. Continued payment to employees. Section 315, a local education agency, state institution of higher education, or other entity that receives funds provided under the heading Education Stabilization Fund, shall to the greatest extent practicable continue to pay its employees and contractors during the period of any disruptions or closures related to the coronavirus. HSTA, HSTA believes that the ESSER II funds need to be viewed as a stopgap measure in advance of President Biden's proposal for Congress's anticipated uh, approval of the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan sometime in the next few weeks. HSTA research and sources indicate that Biden's American Rescue Plan could bring close to $400 million in federal aid to Hawaii's public schools. The Biden stimulus plan requires, the next plan requires 20% of funding to be used on learning loss, while the current stimulus funding has greater flexibility. Time is of the essence. HSD has worked with the Hawaii Department of Education to delay the school year 21-22 teacher assignment and transfer period until March 8th. By using stimulus funding, schools will be able to restore positions, plan for elimination, and avoid more valued school employees leaving Hawaii under the threat of huge pay cuts and layoffs. We would appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rosalie, for being here. Next, we have testimony from KA Coalition providing testimony and support. Good afternoon, Chair Woodson, Chair, Vice Chair Capella, and committee members. My name is Sherry Nakamura, Director of KA Coalition. We're testifying in support of HB 613, HD1. 
we agree that priority for our system should be on restoring positions at the school level and that the federal funds should be used as used to guarantee that these positions are maintained. To be even more specific, we think that the personnel in the classroom, those who are closest to our students should be the highest priority. Therefore, we suggest in our written testimony, amending the language on page four, line 14 and 15, to read and those and who are employed at the school level in the classroom. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for being here. Next, we have individual testimony from Ms. Davis, writing testimony in support. Is Susan Davis here? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I am very pleased to be able to testify on this bill. I also cons consistently testify regarding education at the Board of Education meetings. I strongly support the House Committee on Education for establishing a bill to ensure ESSER II funds are spent to save teachers' jobs. In support of employees who are subject to collective bargaining agreements, Unit 5 and 6, to continue to receive their pay. The superintendent seems to have created her own definition of maintenance of effort. This bill clearly spells out the House's intent to protect the funding from the superintendent's misuse. Preventing a request for a waiver from the Secretary of Education is of utmost importance. If the waiver is granted, then our schools, teachers, and students are at risk. The risk itself will be much larger than the learning law fiction. Also, with a way to be relieved of securing personnel who work at the school level, including any budget reduction that results in a lot of furlough or pay reduction. But the key point of this bill is securing the funding, release, and expenditures from misappropriations by the Department of Education. Its superintendent and the Board of Ed Education, unless certified in writing. What does this certification tell you? The certification prevents the spending of the fund on anything other than salaries, wages, Department of Education officers, employees who are subject to a collective bargaining agreement. And all the funding will be expended, not rolled over in some secret fund. Why is there a need for such a bill? I'm speaking from a community point of view. The superintendent has time and time again disappointed and embarrassed the state of Hawaii. Lastly, is there a bill that would prevent her contract from being renewed? It's personal, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members of the testifiers can please stick to the constructs of the proposal. That would be greatly appreciated. Is there any other individuals that want to provide testimony on <laughs> HD 613 HD1? Seeing none, members, are there any questions? Okay, Vice Chair Pakala. Um, my question is for Dr. Kishimoto. Hi, Representative, I'm on. Hi, perfect. Okay, so I do understand that the DOE has a number of different priorities that it needs to address, but qualified teachers are the most important thing that we need in order to provide and to ensure that our children are getting a quality learning experience. So three of the schools that are in my district um, are in the top five most severely impacted by the teacher shortage crisis. Um, and I'm really worried that the pandemic and the budget crisis could in fact make things even worse. Um, wouldn't this measure ensure that the DOE is able to keep to keep qualified classroom um, teachers in the classroom and in the communities that really need them the most? Um, so I guess my second question is, what's what's your plan to stop the to stop the teacher shortage crisis from getting worse if this measure doesn't pass? Representative, thank you for the question. I appreciate it, and I want to assure everyone listening in, including the legislature, that this superintendent is the it is an advocate for our public school system, our students and all of our employees and quality teachers in the classroom. One of the things that I did early on 
was to create an, a, a report on our financial plans to show how devastating the cuts are in the classroom and what the impact would mean in terms of teacher and staff loss. And it's not just teachers represented by labor unions or, or principals. It's also classroom cleaners that are not represented and are so important to health and safety. The DOE, when we started out this review of our financial plan was at $460 million shortfall for next year. We are now, then we went to a $264 million shortfall. We showed the academic plan impact, I'm sorry, financial plan impact. The governor came back and reinstated 123 million. That 123 million, we are right now reinstating that to the schools so that the schools can go from about a 10% cut to their school budgets down to almost a 1% cut to their budget. So that work is in progress right now. And I've been very clear that any money released back would go first to reinstating the, the staffing that's needed closest to students to support our schools because our students need not only their daily instruction, they need the wraparound supports and they also need learning loss mitigation. So I don't want anyone speaking for me. I think I've spoken very clearly that that is my absolute priority. What I'm hoping we can do is have the conversation about the fact that we still, even with the reinstatement of the 123 million, which is going to the school so they can redo their financial plans uh, and reinstate positions at the school level first and foremost, is that we still have a $141 million shortfall. We had $100 million taken from our schools, from our uh, department this year in the middle of a pandemic, and we don't have enough money to pay our bills. We've got to not only fund the classrooms, but we have to fund the business side of the house that processes payrolls, that run our systems, that provide cleaning support and so forth. This is a holistic system. And I don't want us to have a conversation that's divisive of one group versus another or the school versus the system. The system represents support services. And what I'm asking for as the state superintendent is please reinstate the base budget that $141 million gap in our base budget, which just holds us whole in order for us to be able to not only do what we normally do in a given school year, but also address all the additional costs. Right now I have 25,000 students in the middle grades who are two or more years behind in reading and math. And so we can't have these disconnected conversations. I not only need the teachers, I need security, I need cleaning, and I need intervention support now for these kids so they're not on a pathway to failure as they go into high school and can't do the work. So it, it really is a holistic conversation. And I'm not asking for one thing over another. I'm asking for it all. I'm asking for the reinstatement of our base budget. And I will uh, stretch that money out, but that base budget needs to be reinstated. There was an article today by the Washington Post that highlights uh, Hawaii specifically uh, being in a, a, a poor state in terms of funding its public education system, while there are other states that are modeling, such as Utah is giving uh, teachers right now an additional 15, not only doing covering the base budget, but giving them an additional 1500 COVID uh, a bump up. Right, and the non-teaching staff with a thousand dollar bump up. We may not be able to afford that here in Hawaii, but I am saying we can't afford not to fund the base budget. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, and I do appreciate your comments on having a holistic system, but one of the things that you talked about specifically in your testimony today, talking about the COVID impact and utilizing funds for the COVID impact, and you talked about to address severe learning gaps. And specifically, I think when you're talking about severe learning gaps, the most, the thing that's gonna impact students the most is not having a qualified teacher, especially in communities like my own that really need that solid teacher there in their lives. So I do have one more question. Um, and this goes back to the DOE talking about the use of federal funds to pay for learning loss, um, but nothing will make learning loss 
worse than, than losing teachers, as I just talked about. Um, you've talked about using $53 million worth of federal funds to pay for things like private tutoring companies, often which are based outside of Hawaii. Um, if the DOE needs extra money, which you just talked about the base budget, but have you considered evaluating the number of external contracts that you folks already have to see if there's anything that you can cut down on, for example, the number of contracts you have for maybe testing? Um, because again, truly nothing is more critical than um, to our children's education than to make sure that our KP are taught by qualified educators. And this bill would make sure that we protect those people and those students um, to whom our system and our schools most depend on. So Representative Capella, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. There is nothing more important than having highly qualified educators uh, in front of our students, teaching them and not have that impact. My, my point is that's not enough. And we see that in the achievement outcomes. We see that in the impacts on school campuses. We see that in the additional needs that are coming out of the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so I don't want my words minced and confused that I'm saying there's anything more important than teachers because that is absolutely critical. But I also need these other areas to be funded uh, I have never made a reference to external private contracts. Again, those are words that were hijacked and rephrased. You cannot find any public comment that I've ever made re related to that. So again, I really want us to have a deep conversation about what we need because all the, all the opinions and perspectives are really important and, I, and I'm listening and I also need uh, uh, to, to, to be able to articulate that we need the teachers, we also need to pay our bills in these other areas to run the organization. I'm not asking for anything above the base budget, I'm asking for the base budget to be reinstated so that we can do our work. Our principals stand ready to do this and we ask our legislators to please support this. Um, our, uh, uh, the, the, the set aside that I'm asking for with the federal funds through the Board of Education is related to a personalized learning program that can include tutoring, it can include uh, learning coaches, it can include any number of supports. We know these students already get wraparound services. They have a highly qualified teacher, but they are not succeeding. And 70 to 80% of them have never met grade level expectations. This is a group of students who are really struggling. And what I am asking for is let us not have any students treated as expendable because it's really hard work and we have to figure this out. I don't think this is an easy decision for any of us, but I do ask us to have an honest conversation um, and also to let me speak for myself about what I stand for. I stand for all of my employees and I stand for a high quality public education system. Uh, and that's what I'm putting before the board for the board to consider and think about as they also direct me around what they see as the highest priorities right now. But it's not an if or, it's, it's a both and right now. We've got to address the learning loss for these kids. Uh, they have not been successful historically, and we've got to fund our employee based and keep our, our schools whole. Uh, we will still make uh, uh, cuts back to the state office staff. Uh, and so we, we are still making some adjustments there uh, and, and we'll make some of those tough decisions, um, but we will be protecting the classroom as we continue to move forward. I will also say, I've been also uh, articulating that at the end of the day, if the legislature does not reinstate our base budget and we have this huge shortfall, then the board has been told by me, we're gonna have to go back and look at our federal funds and everything to make sure that closest to the classroom, we, we, uh, we restore uh, those funds to the greatest extent possible, but we still have to address other areas. So I hope I'm being clear about what I am advocating for here. Uh, because the public school system cannot afford to be decimated. We are the backbone of this economy. And I hope that our kids are seen as the future leaders that are going to carry the state forward. So mahalo for the questions. Thank you, Dr. Kishimoto. Thank you, Chair. Members, any other questions? Majority Leader Bilotti. Uh, this question is for um, CFO. 
So I'm looking at tables for the federal funding that's coming down to the multiple states and Hawaii stands to gain close to $420 million with the American Rescue Plan. So in light of that, which we expect will be coming down in, I guess, March, um, can we not accomplish what superintendent just said that we would be able to restore all the base funding with this bill plus anything else that might come down. And so that in fact, we're not actually at odds with one another, but we're just saying, let's put the federal funds towards supporting sufficient staffing and teachers so that our kids can come back to school, which is the primary goal, I think, for all of us. Yeah, I, this is Brian Hallett, CFO for the department. Optimistically, I, I hope you are correct. I, I think what's what's unknown, glaringly unknown, is, is what are we looking at for state support for general funds? Um, with, without that known quantity, it's it's very hard to give an opinion of whether we are there or, or not. Um, I, I would add, it's something that we also reference in our testimony is the uncertainty around how far can these federal funds be stretched um, that will depend in large extent to, to whether or not these, the use of these funds are subject to fringe benefit charges or not. That, that essentially adds an additional 50% cost or, or to, to the use of these funds if they're used for payroll purpose. Um, as pointed out in testimony, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, got to add 10 years ago during the, the Great Recession, those fringe costs were waived for the department and for the University of Hawaii when using federal stabilization funds which, which is exactly the type of funds that we're talking about today. So I'm looking at your tables, CFO. Um, I'm sure if I could keep asking. Please go ahead. Uh, you know, it looks like you have in fact used some of the federal funding for things like unemployment insurance, some of those things that you say that would be additional on top of um, what we are setting aside. So again, I don't know that we're at odds, but what we are saying is as the legislature with this proposal, Let's shore up this money to ensure there's sufficient, uh, sufficient staffing first, rather than, as I think uh, my colleague alluded to, I mean, you know, I want my child who is right now struggling in public school to be able to get tutoring over the summer. But is that something that maybe is not in the core at the moment? Uh, I think that would be a, a, a way to say, yes, we don't need to pay for private tutors now. What we need to do is figure out funding so that we have sufficient staffing both for the rest of this year, as well as, uh, God willing, we will have all of our students in the classroom in the fall. So, you know, I, I guess that's what we're saying, why we want to make sure that these funds go to those purposes versus the other extraneous stuff that has been proposed. Is that, is that a fair, I mean, is that an unreasonable expectation from the legislature? If, if that was a question directed at, at me, I, I, I would suggest that I, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're, where you're coming from. Um, there is a great deal of risk and uncertainty, in particular in, in relation to what is state funding going to look like for the department. And it's very hard to give a, a solid answer to, to your question with, without that part of the equation known. Um, but I, I, I do agree that uh, we, we agree far more um, than we disagree. And then one last question, if, you, if I may, um, what is the expectation? What are you hearing from the Department of Education at the federal level as to guidance coming down potentially for the American Rescue Plan? So I will add that this is Dr. Kishimoto. I, I would just <laughs> add that um, I am on weekly calls, calls with the uh, major organizations that involve the state chiefs. Uh, and we had one this morning. Um, there is no uh, set timeline. Our timeline has been everything from trying to make this happen as quickly as April, May to um, do not expect the monies on the education front until after the school year has started. Um, so it's not, it, it's, there, there really isn't a lot of clarity yet on um, what the education component, how quickly the education component will show up versus other components that they're trying to balance. And that, that was reiterated again this morning uh, in a call that I was on. And it is a weekly call, so we are staying on top of it. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Major Hilliard. Members, any other questions? I have a quick question for Superintendent Kishimoto or CFO Hallett. Um, 
so you know with budgeting there's several moving parts and the budget is not really static it's it's very much fluid and variables collide with one another but i, I want to keep the conversation really high level and um i i think back to your phrasing about how you want to address learning loss and at least with the articles that I'm reading, the white papers with regards to methodology of, of effectively dealing with learning loss, and even with, with how we address learning gaps in general, and looking at you know, successful models in, in Finland, uh, British Columbia, Singapore, uh, uh, Maryland recently uh, overrode a veto to more effectively deal with this very specific issue and, and others. And, in all those examples, in which I think are, are, can be instructive to us, uh, they have teachers dealing with learning loss, defined as uh, they plan to deal with learning loss within the parameters of normal classroom instruction. And they do not think it's effective to have uh, substitute teachers or, or after school classrooms to, to try to make up some of these gains. And so if you can please, you know, briefly speak upon that, because you're you're recommending about $53 million to go just towards uh, learning loss mitigation. And then also as a separate non-related inquiry, uh, health and safety. And so you have at least $15 million fiscal year 22, um, also $3 million fiscal year 21 allocated for health and safety. Uh, my understanding is HAIMA is providing fully funding to accommodate health and safety, specifically with regards to materials, uh, cleaning supply, supplies. And so um, also confused as to why you're, you're spending mul multiple millions upon what is being offered by HIEMA at no cost to the Department of Education. Thank you, Chair, for the, the question. I'll start with the second one. Uh, we were notified by HAIMA that their funding ended uh, uh, February. And so as of March, we are covering $1 million a month for PPEs for the Department of Education. And so the $12 million covers next year, uh, uh, next school year. And it also covers um, some additional funds that are necessary for uh, security where we have impact of uh, homeless, houseless, uh, movements onto on campuses that are that are that are uh, requiring uh, night security in order to secure those campuses before kids show up in the morning. Uh, that's not a new issue. I've asked for that in the last uh, uh, couple of years. It's improved uh, uh, at some point last school year, uh, and we have the same situation again. So that's where the, that fifteen million dollars comes from. It's a million dollars a month for a twelve month period plus three. Three, um, $3 million for additional security that's needed for targeted schools that are impacted by, by movement of, of homeless populations that show up on some of our campuses. Uh, and, and a small part of that is also for ongoing safety and security training as well for our staff. Uh, so uh, related uh, to the, the first question, um, we are also at the both the national level and the Council of Great City Schools meets on a weekly basis to have discussions around how we're having, uh, how, how we're mitigating uh, learning gaps. Uh, we tend to talk about the learning gap because it, these are not learning losses that happen overnight because of COVID. They've gotten more complicated because of COVID. And so we want to be very clear that um, that when when I presented data to the board for the board agenda on Thursday, I'm talking about the history of uh, of not meeting grade level expectations and and the research uh, nationally and internationally speaks about um, leveraging uh, quality educators, providing academic coaching, um, extending a small group academic coaching, not the the one to three hundred guidance counselors that we have. We don't have sufficient counselors necessary to do that, uh, and also to uh, provide uh, the extended. Um, learning time. Uh, as we start to layer on those demands, um, what I have kept open is we have to figure out who is delivering these supports uh, because uh, 
because uh, our teachers are also, uh, as they are dressing, uh, learning during the week, are stretched. And we also have parents who are asking questions about whether there are supports that can be provided in the evening when they're home from work, during the weekends. And so we want to be flexible to be responsive to parents in our design. We don't have an absolute design. We are looking at the research and we'll be convening principals to put proposals together. The, the amount that we are proposing actually has been adjusted. So it's 2000 per middle school student that's two or more years behind and 1000 per elementary student that's two or more years behind. That brings us up to nearly 20, uh, just over 23,000 students. Uh, and this is for uh, not just a summer program, but a program that begins in the summer and supports that continue for an entire school year following that to extend time and extend supports. Okay, th thank you for that. I, I guess just very briefly, it seems like in terms of the main drivers, you're, you're depending upon you know outside instruction to compensate for learning loss. And I, I would just, Probably suggest that in terms of effective strategies that we know work, uh, that should happen during normal school hours, even if you know, we're, we're two years behind uh, of, of instruction. Uh, I, I want to give uh, HSTA uh, a, a opportunity to share any additional comments. This has been a very fruitful conversation, but I also want to see if you have any comments from uh, President Rosenwind. So thank you, Chair Woodson. Last semester, our schools and our principals were asked to cut 10% of their budget. In January, they came back to the Board of Education and this is what they shared. And this is what's currently out there. 1,300 full-time positions, okay? That includes 48 administrators, 798 teachers, librarian or counselors, 345 classified instructional full-time positions, 124 classified non-instructional full-time positions. We're not talking theoretical. We're talking that in a, just a couple of days, these people have been told their positions no longer exist at their schools. And they're taking a pay cut on top of all of this. I cannot tell you, I mean, if you're a brand new teacher who's basically told there's no position for you, you're taking a pay cut when you barely can survive here, they're leaving. And we have the stimulus funding in order to deal with this right now where we can tell the schools right now, we can put the $132 million back at the school level so that we can make sure that we maintain all these positions and also make sure that these teachers know that they can afford to live here in Hawaii. So we're not talking about practically great if we could do this. You know how many times I've come in front of this, the board asking for additional funding for education, but we know with the economic situation we're in, we have to use the funding that we have right now and I truly hope that with the uh, stimulus bill being passed, that already will acquire what the superintendent wants from, uh, uh, it requires things such as summer school le learning and to help, that that's gonna be 20% of the request that they'll be able to achieve those things. The current stimulus funding gives us much more flexibility that we need to act now upon. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Seeing on, thank you, Dr. Kishimoto, for being here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rosenick, for being here. It's an important conversation, man. Uh, you know, none of this is easy, but we'll just try to work work through it. And thank you again. So we will recess for DM. Yeah, recess.
will uh, introduce our decision making on several bills. First up, members, we have HB 533, uh, Spurs and Lay Jordan. Members, I cannot in good conscience recommend passage of these proposals, so therefore we will defer. Moving on to HB 1078, uh, members, I would like to add two new sections um, stating that upon approval, uh, stating that the approval process still needs to be um, uh, provided through the Charter School Commission. And also, I would also like to add a, an additional section that says that if a IEP prescribes through public schools that the school for the deaf and blind is where a child should be placed, that the school has to admit that student. Okay, so normally how charter schools are set up, um, in terms of enrollment, it's, it's optional, but we wanna say that if the IEP prescribes that the student needs that type of support in that setting, that um, they be allowed to do so. Besides that, technical non substantive changes and defecting the date to July 1st, 2050. Questions, comments, concerns? Vice Chair President, please. Voting on House Bill 1078, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Representative Bilotti? Aye. Representative DeCoit? Aye. Representative Ganadin? Aye. Representative Gates? Aye. Representative Hashimoto? Aye. Representative Ono? Excused. Representative Quinlan? Aye. Representative Takayama? Aye. Representative Yamane? Aye. Representative Okimoto? Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Moving on to HB 443, Department of Education and Analysis of Local Food for Student Meals. I'd like to pass this, defecting the date to July 1st, 2050. Questions, comments, concerns? Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on House Bill 443, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting the excused absence of Representative Ono, are there any reservations? Any noes? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Uh, thank you, members. Moving on to HB 702, HD1, establishing equipment rules for a geographic preference for uh, farm to school. Members, I would like to defect with the defective date to July 1st, 2005-1. Questions, comments, concerns? Question for the vote. Voting on House Bill 702, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting the excused absence of Representative Ono. Are there any reservations? Any no's? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Moving on to HB 767, HD 1, Farm School Program. So I would like to defect the date to July 1st, 2005-1. Questions, comments, concerns? Vice Chair, for the vote, please. Voting on House Bill 767, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye, noting the excused absence of Representative Ono. Are there any reservations? Any no's? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Moving on to HB one eight one, excuse me, HB eight one two, Trauma Informed Education and the Department of Education Pilot Program. Members, I would like to pass this defecting the date to July first, two thousand five zero. Questions, comments, concerns. Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on House Bill eight one two, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye, noting the excused absence of Representative Ono. Are there any reservations? Any noes? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Moving on to uh, HB 574, HD1, DOE, Disaster Relief Funds. Members, I would like to defer this bill per the testimony from the department and HAIMA as it would be a detriment. So, deferred. Next, moving on to proposed language in HB 613, HD1. Members, uh, first on page. On page two, members line 19 and 20, I would like to strike out the language with regards to participants, precipitous decline as that might jeopardize future funding. Uh, also on, in section two, I would just like to add appropriation language with regards to the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2021, uh, defect in the date July 1st, 2050, and technical non substantive changes. Questions, comments, concerns? Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on House Bill 613, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Noting the excused absence of Representative Ono, are there any reservations? Reservations. 
Representative Okimoto reservation. Any no's? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair.